Okay, so controlling disease transmission. So what are some concepts or strategies for um, controlling how disease spreads? So one is, the first one is isolation. So isolation is you're going to keep the patient, <laughs> shoot, once again, I can't get the pen to work. Um, hold on. You keep the, the patient or the infected person by themselves, and depending on what the disease is or what the pathogen is, there's going to be different levels of precaution. Um, okay, quarantine is a type of isolation, but quarantine would be if um, you'd ride out, if you think you're exposed to a pathogen, okay, so they, you have the potential to be exposed to, like, say, Ebola, okay, then you're going to be separated from others until the incubation period is over. Okay, so so then if the incubation period from, if you think you've been exposed, the, the one case that I think of is when there was the recent Ebola outbreak and one of the nurses was from the U.S. and she came back and it was potential, po she was possibly exposed and they tried to quarantine her for three weeks and she was like out riding her bike, so they made a big deal about that because she probably should not have been out in the in the normal population. Okay, then immunization, so that's vaccinating, and then vector control. So vector control is controlling like the mosquitoes or whatever is spreading the organism. Okay, so public health organizations. So the three big ones. So CDC is the Center for Disease Control, which is in Atlanta, the World Health Organization, which is international, so that's gonna that's centered in Switzerland, and then um, this is talking about notifiable diseases. So there's a list of notifiable diseases on the internet and on in your book. So those are diseases that are of concern. So if a physician sees them, they are supposed to report it to the health department. And then the health depart the local health department will report it to the state health department and it'll go on up the food chain. Okay, so the CDC puts out a publication every week and it's called the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. So it has an update of the notifiable diseases. There's usually like a feature article, you know, of something that they've studied for a while and they want to make sure everybody knows about it. Um so you can look, use of registry to improve acute stroke care, maternal pregnancy and birth characteristics of Asians and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, um, announcements. I mean, there's there's um, statistics in it and, like, cool stories that are interesting or things that might be unique. It's online now. It used to be a, a book that came every, like a magazine that came every week, but now it's online, so you can access it. Okay, now, nosocomial infections, I mentioned this before, but those are um, hospital-borne or healthcare setting infections. So things that are, are um, that somebody gets when they're in a healthcare setting versus exogenous, which would be something outside. Okay, so these, you can look up nosocomial infections or hospital-borne infections on, at any, um, on websites. That there should be available. Every healthcare facility is supposed to um, release those. So, contributing factors to these kinds of infections is that one, the patients are very susceptible because they're they're sick, right? Or their immune system is compromised. The second thing is that the microbes can be very virulent or have resistance because they've gone through more than one person and that they have um, and um, they've gone through one more than one person and they've probably been exposed to more than one antibiotic. Okay, and there can be a chain of transmission where if a doctor comes in and he sees a patient and he doesn't wash his hands between the next patient, okay, things can be transmitted by accident. Okay, so this is a... a, a I guess a chart of some pathogens that are common 
in hospital-borne infections, so E. coli, Staph aureus, Strep, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella. Candida is a yeast infection. Okay, so this, this is just a chart of what's out there. Okay, now exogenous transmission is how do things get from the outside in. So they can come in just through doors with people, insects, okay, with visitors, with patients. Okay, equipment could be contaminated. Um, so it just kind of tries to show you how things can move. Okay, here's a chart, um, and I don't know how actually how old this one is, but this is a, a table of notifiable diseases. So you can look, and some of the things will be familiar, but some of them, like Lyme diseases on here, malaria, mumps, um, other things are going to be more rare that you haven't heard of. So syphilis is on here, probably gonorrhea, hepatitis, giardia, okay, botulism. So there's there's a whole big list. So it's a lot of different things on the notifiable diseases. Okay, now um, to control transmission of diseases, another thing is... Um, using universal precautions. So I have another slide uh, of that on the next page. Um, minimizing invasive procedures. Okay, so if you don't have to have surgery, I wouldn't do it because, I mean, the more wounds that you create in a body, the more chances you are to have um, an infection. Okay, surveillance. So surveillance is monitoring so most hospitals and healthcare facilities have an infection control specialist. And that person is monitoring what's in the hospital or like quality control is what we have in biomanufacturing. And they're monitoring um, what's going on in the hospital and looking for abnormal bacteria or abnormal numbers of bacteria. Okay, and they're going to try to prevent things that aren't supposed to be there from being there. Okay, and the other thing is um, monitor antibiotic use. So only prescribe antibiotics when they're necessary. Make sure you complete the whole, the whole course of antibiotics. Okay, so universal precautions from the CDC. Um, Gloves and gowns, you guys could read this, you probably don't need me. Gloves and gowns of soiling of hands, exposed skin, or clothing with um, body or blood or body fluids is likely mask and protective and protective eyewear or face, face shields if they're splashing or splattering of blood or body fluids is likely, so mask alone is not sufficient. Wash hands before and after and after removal of gloves. Change gloves before each patient. Um, disposable mouthpiece for um, cardiopulmonary rec recitation. The sharps need to go straight into a container. The needle shouldn't be bent, clipped, or recapped. And then here's what they recommend for cleaning up blood or contaminated fluids. Okay, um, bioterrorism is in this chapter. We'll talk more about anthrax in the beginning of the, um, the chapter after the next one, but bioterrorism is in here. So there are lots of threats. There are things that people use as, or countries use as weapons out there. So things like anthrax, um, maybe smallpox. So there, there are things out there that are threats. And then control measures are to vaccinate and to monitor the population.